What's up, everyone? We're back with another episode of the Dub Jelson Podcast, and today I have an MMA legend with me, Eve Edwards. Eve, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's nice to have uh, like legends like you, and I've had Dean Thomas on, too. It's nice that I'm getting uh, recognized, and you guys are willing to do this. It actually, it really means a lot. We all start, you know, we all start at the same place, man, so you got to pay it forward, right? Um mm-hmm. And also, we're like old school guys. Not a lot of people know us. So, for a young guy like you to 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 talk to to know about myself and Dean Thomas, you know, guys who who have done this since before the sport got to be where it is today, um, appreciate it. Yeah, I never I never got the chance to see you fight uh, live. I was I'm pretty new to the sport. The first one that I uh, that I watched, the first pay per view was like UFC 232, which was Jones and Gus two. Um, it really made me fall in love with the sport. So after that, I've been balls deep in MMA. It's probably my favorite sport now. But, uh, um, I mean, just listen to guys like Rogan. I'm a big Rogan fan. Um, he talks about you guys all the time. So I've kind of started picking up the older fighters and kind of watching older fights um, to just try to get a better understanding of how the sport's evolved. Yeah, um, it's really changed, man. I really didn't expect to see the sport reach this level in my lifetime in the lifetime of my career and um and now that i'm retired i feel like in the past five six years uh, the sport has still still grown so much so quickly so um this is not something i thought i would even see in my lifetime but you know there are millionaires because of mixed martial arts annually <laughs> so that mm-hmm. um that's definitely a plus because shoot my first ufc contract was four and four <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, now guys are making, I think the lowest you can make is like 10 and 10, I believe. I think so. I still think that's kind of low, but like, um, yeah, is very low. I still appreciate the fact that, that the numbers have gone up and, um, you know, champions can, can be millionaires but, and mm-hmm. contenders can be millionaires. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've kind of seen over the past month, two months, um, guys like John Jones and Mas Vidal. Uh, come out and kind of gripe about the the pay in the UFC. What's kind of been your um, your thoughts about all of this? Um, when it comes to to finances and fighting, I'm always fighter first. Um, mm-hmm. I was a fighter. I know what it takes to to get in there. I was at the top of the game at one point, so I know how much effort that takes. And now I'm sure it's got to be harder because there are more people. Um, the sport is bigger. Um, there are more challenges out there. And so the work ethic has got to be so much harder. And a guy like Jorge Masvidal, who's been there since towards the tail end of my career, but um, he, he had been established even before we competed against each other. Um, and to still be doing it at this level, um, um, I appreciate that. But again, back to the finances. Yeah, I think the, the monetary split is... <laughs> definitely a one-way thing it's beneficial one way and um i just i really think that guys like john jones and 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 jorge masvidal should be making enough money that and 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 anybody in the ufc really should be making enough money so that this argument isn't even had you know um i don't feel that there's anybody established particularly established guys in the ufc should have to um work another job you know mm-hmm. um i feel like and i've said this before i feel like mixed martial arts is in in the state of where the nfl was in the 60s and 70s you know you had de- you had offensive and defensive linemen um working at ace hardware in the off season um i'm sure there are some usc guys that are driving uber and lyft and work another job um stipe miocic you know the the heavyweight champion He's still working as a fireman. Fireman. So I know that. Um, I know a lot of that is his character, but um, I also wonder how much of that is because um, you know, he gets insurance for his family. <laughs> Did do, do UFC fighters not get insurance through the through the promotion? So the insurance that fighters get through the through the UFC, if it's the same as when I was still competing, it's really just for emergency. It's really. It kind of only protects the UFC's product, the fighters of the product. And um, it's not something that you can go into an ER for, 
you in the gym, you headbutt each other. Somebody got a headbutt and got to get some stitches. You go to the ER. Um, it's really not going to put a dent into that. It's um, you haven't met the deductible yet, you know. But it is effective. I've used it um, as an athlete in the UFC for a bicep tear. You know, now that's a major surgery, and um, it's I forget what the deductible was, but. After that, I feel I feel like it was a hundred percent, and my rehab and everything was 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 a part of the package. Um, but yeah, I couldn't go into um, get a prescription mm-hmm. with, with that insurance, you know. And um, I don't think that's changed. I I can't be positive, but I could ask some of my friends. I haven't. We had that's not something we talk about, but I could definitely I could definitely ask them and, and find out. And I just don't think that they would say that that's a part of the insurance now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like there's a, there's a bunch of different things that, uh, that need to happen <clears throat> regarding fighter pay. I mean, you look at a guy like Jeff Neal, he's in the top 15 of the welterweight division and he had to go back working at a Texas steakhouse during the pandemic. So he can fight. So it's just like unfortunate like that. And I, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of, uh, no one wants to see fighters take on another job. Like, that seems highly um, unnecessary for me, especially given what they do. They're risking their lives. I mean, God forbid no one's died in the UFC, but that could happen one day. Um, and they have to go work other jobs just to make ends meet. Yeah, and um, even let's not even put the mortality into it. Just the, the, the fact that a, a single fight can cause enough injury that you can never compete again. Mm-hmm. You know? Um then you've risked everything that you like the thing that you have the most passion for because there's nobody there's I, I'm sorry if you're in the UFC and this is not the thing MMA is not the thing that you have the most passion for you're in the wrong place you know so like I assume that everybody's there everybody there has the most passion for mixed martial arts so um, <clears throat> if you're in the UFC you have the highest passion for mixed martial arts you're giving it everything that you feel you can and um, to only be getting you know enough to survive um that that's disheartening especially at this level of the game when there's so much money being made um i don't know what if you took a card and just the the contracted purses not any bonuses or anything like that i i i would like to add one of those up and see what that looks like because i know for a fact guaranteed right because of the ESPN numbers that were put out when 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 the deal was made, that the UFC's once a show starts, the UFC's at they they made ten million dollars. ESPN has paid them ten million dollars for that show, right? Um, now that's that's not talking about concessions. That's not talking about merch that's sold. That's not pay per views, you know, or their their percentage of the pay per view. That's not any of that. That's just for the event to be held. Um, from the from from all the reports that I've read on that, for the amount of shows that they were that ESPN was purchasing per year over the time frame, I think that worked out to ten million dollars a show. So, um, and I don't, I honestly, I don't believe that Fighter Purse is contracted um, on, let's say, the last card, uh, the Poirier and and Dan Hooker. I don't think that their contracts. Payments were probably over two and a half. Like I'm just guessing. I don't know the numbers for sure. But on contract, I don't think that would be. They 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 paid more than two and a half million dollars out minus the um the TV bonuses or, or any of the the performance bonuses. Which the performance bonuses like at this point those things need to be a lot higher those things those things could be five hundred thousand dollars that's life-changing money fifty thousand dollars isn't life-changing money in this day and age um yeah i i i think those things change also though this is a side note this is along the same lines but this is another thing that i've been thinking and i've said this i don't think fighters need to be fighting for a show and a win purse um the entirety of that that money should be allotted for the fighters because i'll tell you this from experience i've never been defending a takedown defending a choke trying to escape bottom when 
Joe Stevenson was on top of me and he landed an elbow that split me open and I was bleeding everywhere. There was not a second in my mind that I was thinking, oh boy, I got to deal with this cut because then I'm going to get twice as much money as like, I'm just thinking, I got to figure this out. I got to win. I have to win this fight. I have to win. This. And that, that had nothing to do with money. That had to do with, with who I am as a person and, and the pride. And everybody inside the cage is like that. You know, um, you have to break a man. You have to let like Robbie Lawler and, 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 and Rory McDonald. When Rory got his face broken and he sat down and conceded, it wasn't because he, he never thought, oh boy, I'm not going to get all that money. It was because his skull was fractured and his body quit. His body went into survival mode and was like, "I can't do this anymore. I give up." That's that's what that's what it's going to take for guys in the UFC to quit to 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 not not even quit like to to concede. And um, there's no there's no dollar amount you can put on that. So whatever the contract says, this to show and this to win. That all needs to say this to show, and that's it. The win portion mm-hmm. is. Discretion should be discretionary or or um, performance based if you give performance bonuses. Mm-hmm. I know um, Rogan's been a big proponent of that as well. Um, so, but I wanted to talk about how much uh, money fighters actually get paid. So, like when um, John was kind of beefing with the UFC, he still is, but um, he said that he made like like when the numbers come out from like MMA fighting or one of those sites, it says like 500k flat. But then you talk about, like, the pay-per-view numbers and all that stuff. And DC was talking about um, how his two fights with, with John Jones, he made, like, $4 million, I think, something around there, 2 or $4 million. Um, So I was wondering if you had any insight on, like, how much fighters actually make above their, um, their uh, disclosed earnings. Well, that is reserved for the champions and uh, headliners on, on some of the – events that aren't pay-per-views. Um, the champions get a portion of the pay-per-view cut, and that those are negotiated. I don't know what numbers everybody gets. Um, I don't know how much their management is able to convince the UFC that those guys are worth. You know, um, But I do believe that is different for every individual. Um, <clears throat> uh, and once again, only in those title fights. Does that happen? Um, not not only, but primarily in those title fights, does that happen? I don't know for a fact, but I would assume that, like, say, for the BMF title. I mean, it's a title fight, but I, I would assume that they both got pay-per-view points on that. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of these co-main events, some of these high, highly anticipated co-main events were also for um, – and non-title fights I'm talking about um, were also negotiated um, into, into the pay-per-view points. But um, I know the fa- the only thing that I know that's factual is that <clears throat> the the title fights, the headliners, um, and the title fights are the ones who get points on pay per view. So so you know you can be a ranked fighter. Um, let's take oh boy, I can't think of. But let's just imagine if Jeff Neal were to fight um, Ponzinibbio on an undercard. I doubt those guys get pay per view points. Yeah. Um, may get some discretionary bonus, you know, but that 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 is determined by the UFC brass and it's like, oh, you know what, that fight was a good fight. Let's give these guys a hundred thousand dollars. That's you know, that that's that's nice, but um I don't know. I, I think these guys need to be making the kind of money that, that like guaranteed that yeah. keeps you one fight Especially if you're ranked in the UFC, especially if you're ranked. But I really think that every athlete in the UFC who's 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 been established, I would say, has had three, four, five fights in the UFC. Um, they should make enough money per fight that if this were to happen again, they would be straight for at least a year. Mm-hmm. That's my thoughts. Yeah, I think that's. I think that a lot of the um, the fans are starting to come to the realization that fighters need to need to get paid more. And um, I'm understanding why John's not fighting or why Masvidal turned down the fight with Usman at first. Um, obviously, he's taking it now. But um, there was some talk about fighters unionizing, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on that because I don't really know the the ins and outs of um, union unionization. 
and especially how it would relate to the fight game. Um, I'm sure there are details that I, I couldn't really understand, but what I do understand about unions, uh, I'm, I'm in a union, I'm in the SAG union, and um, that's probably the most, if not the most powerful, it's one of the most powerful unions um, in the country, and <clears throat> there, there are things that, that a union would really do to help fighters. They, they would be a minimum. They, they, they could have a minimum on, on purses, on what, what a fighter makes a year. Um, fighters would just have so much more say in, in the activity that they're competing in. You know what I mean? Fighters, literally right now, the only thing fighters have is a, a say in is whether or not they're willing to fight that person. Mm -hmm. But even then, there, there are powers that are above them in the sense of, let's imagine you're the UFC, I'm still active. And you call me and you say, Eve, we're offering you Dean Thomas. And I say to you, oh, man, that style matchup is not good for me. I'm thinking to myself, that style matchup is not good for me. Um, yeah. Um, no, nah, give me somebody else. I'm not fighting Dean Thomas. I, I, that's not a fight I want. Give me, make me another offer. And they say, well, if you don't fight Dean Thomas on August 6th, then we don't have anything for you until February. Um, we're not even going to consider you until February. But that, that leaves September, October, November, December, the quarantine, basically, where mm -hmm. Jeff Neal has to go back to work. That's the situation yeah. you're putting a fighter in when he doesn't do what you ask him to do, and you're like, huh, we want him to do this. So fighters would have more leverage in a situation like that um, simply because of the union. Um, they, they would... The union can make rules or, or demand certain rules whether um, where things like this is an offer, you can make a counter offer, or you have to present so many options, right? And then the guys have to agree. So you, you make me an offer. Um, as the UFC, you make me an offer. Dean Thomas, Dustin Poirier, Dan Hooker, Edson Barbosa, and um, you make the same offer to, to Dean Thomas. You can get Eve Edwards, Dan Hooker, Edson Barbosa, Dustin Poirier. Those are your potential opponents. And I go, well, Dustin Poirier or Dan Hooker. I'm sorry, um, Dean Thomas or Dan Hooker. And then Dean goes, all right, Eve Edwards or Dustin Poirier. And then they go, okay, they both agree on Eve and Dustin. So, I mean, even Dean. So, you put those two together. That that's that's a potent, That's an option that that the union that that unionizing could bring to the table, you know. But right now, fighters have no. I don't want that fight. I I can give you a list of guys that I want to fight, and then the UFC is like, uh, okay, we can improve that, or no, we don't like that. This is who we want you to fight. Otherwise, we put you on the shelf. And that's been done. To some guys, you know, um, they don't take the fight that's offered, and it's like, oh well, you gotta have to wait. You know? So so that's that's. Yeah, that's one thing, and I think that's a huge thing. You know, it just gives fighters more leverage. Having someone in, someone having their back, and being a group, um, that whole group, it's like group, group economics. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think the UFC did some good um, putting on fights during the pandemic, so fighters did have an opportunity to fight and make money if they wanted to. Um, they didn't let go any employees. That's what Dana said. I don't know if that's if that's true. But I did see you. You're a PFL commentator, and I saw that the PFL was giving the, all the fighters a stipend um, throughout the pandemic. So I think that that could be another option if fighters don't want to fight in the UFC. But I mean, it just depends on what the what the UFC brass wants to do. Well, I'm I am a big fan of all these other promotions existing because they give fighters options. And I am even a bigger fan of these promotions growing, getting to the point where um the UFC is going to be recognized as mixed martial arts for people who are um the uninitiated and for people who do know the sport, it's gonna be recognized as the big as the big dog. You know, but one FC, Ryzen, Bellator, PFL these other promotions existing um, gives fighters options. I would like to see some of them continue to grow um, and not necessarily rival the UFC in the sense of, what am I going to watch? There's a UFC tonight and there's a PFL tonight, but rival the UFC in, in the sense of if fighters aren't unionized um, and then they feel disrespected, mistreated, they have options. 
you know, um, a union would give, here's another thing you, I believe a union, another strength a union would give to fighters. Um, you sign your UFC contract, you, the UFC has the option to release you from that contract should you lose or for, for certain other, other reasons. You don't have the option to talk to anybody else about how much they're willing to pay you to fight. You don't have the option of saying, this contract is not, this is not beneficial to me. I, I want out of this contract. You don't really have that option. You, know? um, <clears throat> you, you have the option not to fight. You know, but if you're signed, if you're signed, you're signed to an exclusive fight contract, um, but you're not an employee, so you can't work anywhere else, but you don't really work there, you know. And that that's that's really not only the UFC. That's really most promotions. There are some exceptions to the to that rule. Some promotions, and depending on the person, they will um, write that language in the contract that you can have conversations with other promotions you know i had a contract with the ufc and with pride at the same time but and the ufc did as a lightweight when they were only having five shows a year you know i still needed more work i still need wanted to show up my skills and so i was still fighting in some of the smaller promotions but that was also a different time for the sport yeah no doubt um <clears throat> sorry about that clear my my throat. But yeah, I think that uh, I think that it's trending in the in a positive direction um, from a fan's view, and I I understand what you're saying with the with the fighters that have to sign like um, like for example, Masvidal, he signed an eight fight deal, and then he blows up, becomes a massive superstar, and he's stuck to that eight fight same eight fight deal where he's making say eighty and eighty or whatever it is, um, and he can't really he doesn't have a lot of room to, a lot a lot of room to negotiate up to try to get more money and i think that that's something that the ufc needs to fix or more guys are going to start leaving yeah um but again they run into when you talk about leaving you run into that problem you um you sign an eight fight deal over i would say four fight deals with the ufc are usually 18 months so i would assume eight fight deals are for 36 months right so you fought three fights you, you beat darren till um Ben Askren and and then Nate Diaz, right? Mm -hmm. You beat those three guys, and you still have what's that? You still have two and a half years on your contract, and um, <clears throat> you have you still owe them five fights at these rates. Mm -hmm. you know? So, and you can't walk away. Like you, you still you're still in your prime, and you can't come to an agreement. And you're such a hot commodity, but nobody else is allowed to talk to you. Mm -hmm. you know? Meanwhile, the UFC, they have the potential to go, okay, well, let's start promoting. Let's see, who else? Who else is at 170, right? Uh, let's start promoting Jeff Neal. Let's, let's, let's start making that name a household name. They have the option to do that. Why well, he has the talent, he has the skills to compete with anybody in that division, um, beat any of them. Um, but you know, you don't want you don't want Masvidal's attitude, or, or he's he wants more money, and you don't want to pay him that. You have all these other options. So that's that's just another aspect of the one sidedness, and that's that's business. That's kind of business in America, a business in the world, really, right now. But we have to. Not well, we have to, but I, I would recommend a union for fighters because of things like that. You just have some. You would have some power behind you. You'd have some engine motiv motivating behind you, and um, you'd be able to do a little bit more. Have someone to stand up and fight for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that makes sense to me. I, I'm hoping the UFC starts paying the guys more and the and the women more for that matter. Um, but I wanted to transition to your friend Dan or uh, not Dan Hooker, Dustin Poirier. Um, yeah, you had a friends with dan too oh we're, we're internet friends so it's cool yeah but uh but your boy uh dustin poirier i mean he's a savage he won that fight last weekend against dan hooker um talk about talk about that fight and how you see dustin moving forward man that fight i watch fights a little different from from 
your average fight fan, I guess. Um, I still watch the technique, the punches and the kicks. Um, but I wonder if having had some of those experiences, if I see things a little bit differently in the sense of um, that fight, we saw two dogs, right? And they both wanted it. And Dan Hooker didn't break, but neither did Dustin Poirier. Um, but the experience showed out. If Dan Hooker had had as much five round experience, as much fight experience as Dustin had, that's the only way that fight gets better. And then I still don't know who wins that fight. Um, it was really close. And, and, and we saw in that fight where Dan was, was, was strong and coming forward and doing the things that he needed to do. And Dustin, when he was in trouble, it was like, okay, I'm, I got, Dustin has a really good guillotine so here's a series right here just this this sequence that happened um dustin has hooker in that guillotine he's working for it he's like i have a really good guillotine i feel like i have it i'm gonna go for this i'm giving it my all i'm giving it my all and he gets out okay i'm going for this armbar i'm going for this I, i'm gonna get this armbar i'm gonna get this armbar from guard and i'm going for it and then he block okay those didn't work i'm getting up and then he gets up right um that that mentality that that that's who dustin is you know you can't hold that kid down man um the only person, the only person that I've seen to ever frustrate Dustin was Khabib, and um, I mean, Khabib's twenty eight zero for a reason, right? Um, yeah, like Dustin going forward, that that's special, especially with um, Gaethje and Khabib fighting. Why? Because although Dustin has that win over over Gaethje and the loss to Khabib, it's one of those fighter ABC scenarios. It doesn't doesn't necessarily work that way, um, and Gaethje's wrestling pedigree. Um, maybe enough. Khabib is proven to be the best wrestler in MMA, um, but Gaethje may have enough wrestling or maybe good enough to, if not stuff, all of his takedowns, stifle a lot of them, and, and he's a better striker. He's powerful. Um, and even not stuff all those takedowns, being a Division One All-American, he probably has the ability to get back to his feet like most people can't against Khabib. And then, once again, I feel like he's the better striker and he's very powerful there. So he could be the guy, the one guy to beat Khabib. I thought I do still think Tony Ferguson is a concern um, because of his weird style, but I don't know if, if Khabib's not... Um, if, I do believe that Khabib could control him. Um, but if Gaethje beats Khabib, Dustin's the last guy to beat, beat Gaethje. And... You know, if Khabib doesn't get that immediate rematch, Dustin has an opportunity to win the undisputed title. Um, I think Dustin has the, has the ability to, to beat Khabib also. He's learned a lot from that fight with Khabib. And I think Khabib going into that fight should be the favorite again. But, you know, things could be different. He did he did well against Khabib. Um, but he also suffered the same fate as most people against Khabib when he did get on the bottom. So, like... I don't know. The future potentially is extremely bright for Dustin, but at the very least, I I see I, we see him face a title ch um, challenge for the title one more time, at least one more time. Yeah, I think he will, uh, no doubt. The fight that I want to see, and I think the fight that the UFC should the UFC should make is say McGregor, McGregor Poirier too. Yeah. I want that so bad. <laughs> I think that'd be. I mean, I think Dustin deserves it. He deserves that big payday. And if Connor really wants that title back, that's the guy who he needs to beat. Agreed. 100% agreed. Um, and I think, you know, Dustin's grown quite a bit since that first fight. Connor, he's the kind of guy who's, he gets in your head. Um, he got in Dustin's head. I don't think he intimidated him, but he got in his head and made him more emotional than he should be. You know, yeah. um, and that's something that Dustin had to work on. We saw that ha we saw that affect him in the first Eddie fight. We saw that affect him, I believe, in the Michael Johnson fight. Um, but and, and it's kind of like the thing that Cody Garbrandt has. He has that like when 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 things get things get um, savage or, or, or desperate, like the the no quitting him comes out and it's like kill or be killed. Um, mm -hmm. Dustin used to have that, but I think he's more patient now. Um, and even when he hurts you, he doesn't get overly aggressive. He's still smart and, and calculated there. So I think um, the fight with, with Connor is different because of that. Um, Connor still has the skills to beat almost everybody in that division. Um, that's why he's ranked so high, and that's why he's a former champion. But 
same thing with Dustin, you know. Um, and the fight the first time around was it was a competitive fight. Um, it was a shot to the back of the head, not intent, not not illegally intentional, and not even illegal. It's just where the shot landed stunned Dustin, and Connor was able to capitalize on that. Um, that's not to say that it couldn't happen again. It could happen again, but it could also happen again the other way. That's definitely a fight I want to see. Um, and I, but I do think Dustin is a lot more mature now, and that that's a good that that'd be one a good one to get back. I, I want to see that fight so bad. I mean, Dustin's one of my top five favorite fighters, and I I think that Connor would probably be favored in that fight. But I think that Dustin would win that one just because Connor would come out fly at him, kind of like how Hooker did. I think um, Poirier dropped the first two rounds against Hooker and then came back and just um, sliced him up. And I think that'd be the, the same thing that would happen with, against uh, McGregor. I think um, I think potentially, but I, like both of those guys, Connor and, and Dustin, they're both good boxers, you know? Um, Different styles of boxing, but they're both very good boxers. Connor is more a sharpshooter with power, and Dustin is is a gritty, you know, grinding fighter boxer with power. He can brawl, but he can also box. Um, yeah, I really like that fight, man. I, I would love if Dustin does not fight for a belt in his next bout. That's really the only thing I want to see. And the only thing. Only other fight that's potentially on the board for me to have any interest is is, is Dustin and Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that'd be a great fight too. Um, I don't know how how long Tony will be out just because he got murked in that uh in that fight with Gaethje, but uh, that'd be a, another great fight. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Ferguson style, um, Gaethje had all the answers, um, but. Part of that is because of his skill set, you know. Um, yeah. Dustin has a really good skill set also. Um, and he may have all the answers, but he doesn't have the same answers as Gaethje. So uh, that could go, that could look very different, but it could also look very much the same. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a little bit about the fights on Fight Island um, this weekend coming up on Saturday. So to, what, by the time this comes out, it'll be tomorrow. Um, how do you see the whole Usman Masvidal fight playing out, and how much of a bad motherfucker is Masvidal for taking this fight on six days' notice? Masvidal is always training, so I, I'm not surprised. Um, Masvidal loves to fight. You know, um, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, I will tell you this right now. This is about Jorge Masvidal. Imagine Jorge Masvidal did not know Francis Ngannou, or even if he does, it doesn't matter. Francis Ngannou says something out of line to Jorge Masvidal. He's ready to fight. Mm -hmm. So, so like, I'm not surprised that Jorge Masvidal took this fight. Um, he, he's not going to back down from anybody. Um, how does this plays out? I think, I think, and in shape, Masvidal wins this fight. I think he's too good. Masvidal is the best guy I've ever trained with. He can do everything. People don't know about his ground. He has one submission, I believe, on his record. But um, he can do everything. Masvidal could walk into a Division One wrestling room and make Division One wrestlers believe that at some point in his life, he wrestled Division One. He could walk into any boxing gym on the planet and those guys would tell you that, yeah, that guy has pro boxing potential or, or he's a pro boxing, he has pro boxing skills. Um, I'm talking about world champions to Olympic champions, all of that. Um, and then jujitsu wise, he, he understands the whole game. I mean, Damian Maya couldn't submit him. Yeah. He controlled position, but Damian Maya does that to everybody. He does that to jujitsu black belts, you know? Um, so, so, but that, that's a level Masvidal is on. He's, he's, he has a high level of skill in every aspect of the sport and the drive and the work ethic. He's, he's always conditioned. He's always, um, he's always in shape. And then he doesn't like to lose. He's, um, he's lost some fights in the past. Um, I think a lot of those come, could be chalked up to, you know, distractions, um, not necessarily in his training or anything like that, but in the fight itself, um, thinking that no, oh, this guy isn't as good as I did. Just, just having disinterest in the guy, you know. Um, Masvidal 
our fight, my fight with Masvidal, I, I knew he respected me. We, we, we had conversations before that fight. We had conversations the week of that fight. Um, I know the respect that he had for me at that time. And I think part of that is why he performed so well in that fight. Um, it was one of those things that he said, he says he looked up to me then. Um, and so he has, he has an opportunity to, 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 to knock off somebody that, that he admires. And um, he put all the work in. And losing fights around that, I feel like some of those guys were just, they just didn't motivate him. You know, he's at the top of the game now. And um, the title motivates him more than anything else. Um, being the best in the world motivates him. And he don't like Usman. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think Usman Usman is nails, man. Usman can fight. I I always thought Usman would be the toughest challenge for Woodley. I didn't. I thought he could win that, but I didn't expect him to walk through him like he did. But um, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. But um, you're not going to break Jorge Masvidal, and when you're not going to break him, Usman probably has slightly better wrestling but not by enough that he's going to be able to make that fight happen the way he wants it to. And the boxing department, Usman's boxing has improved so much, but Masvidal is probably, arguably, the best boxer in mixed martial arts. I, I would put him on that list, Cody Garbrandt on that list, Poirier on that list, even though his style doesn't look like like pure boxing, but his boxing is so sharp. Um, yeah, that's... I'm sure there are other Jeff Neal, but like those guys, they're some of the best boxers in the sport. And Masvidal would look good against any of those guys. Straight boxing. Yeah, he's he's no doubt a dog. I think the um, the telltale sign of this fight will be if he can um, stuff enough takedowns um, in order to keep it more of a stand up fight, which I I think he will. I have him winning. Um, I want to see him knock out Usman. I think that'd be I, an amazing story. It doesn't hurt him. I I really hope the six six days notice in the weight cut doesn't hurt him. And if that, um, like like I said, he's always he's always training. You know, um, being in fight shape is a little bit different, but he's always prepared. And I do believe, with all the experience that he has, he knows himself well enough and his body well enough, um, and fighting and the psychology behind fighting well enough that it won't affect him. But there's always the potential that it could. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that you said that kind of raised my eyebrows was you said that Masvidal is the best um, fighter you've ever trained with. So who else? Who else is on that list that he'd be better than? Um, shoot, I've trained with a lot of guys. Um, shoot, everybody at ATT, <laughs> you know, um, from Mike Brown, um, Dustin Poirier. Um, Tyron Woodley, Robbie Lawler, um, like all those guys are great. But when I say Masvidal is the best guy I've ever trained with, he's one of those guys who, who like, yeah, you're seeing it now. You know, you're seeing a lot of him now. But in every aspect of the game, you know, he's he's very good, always competitive. Um, one of the best wrestlers you you will know, you know, one of the best jujitsu players who doesn't, who's not a jujitsu guy, um, and one of the best boxers. He's I've trained with so many guys, man. Um, Joe Schilling, Alan Joban, Mickey Gall. Like I've trained with a lot of guys, but Masvidal has consistently been one of the best guys ever, and um, I think he's quietly, like I, he's he's definitely the best guy I've ever trained with for sure. That's that's super high praise coming from you. Um, you mentioned Mickey Gall. I wanted to ask you this before I forgot. Um, I'm assuming you, you saw the uh, video of Mike Perry last night. I actually, I just saw it last night. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, um, I know it's kind of a lot to take in, just a lot of craziness, but kind of what were your, what were your initial feelings about that? I don't know all the details. Now, watching that, he, Perry was talking about some altercation that happened before the video started with somebody else and people pushing on him. Now people saying he's trying to separate you. And maybe that's the case. Maybe not. Um, and then like, I, I also understand emotions, you know, and Mike Perry is a very emotional guy. So he's yelling at these people, um, you know, to get away from him. Um, people are talking shit to him. He's talking shit back. And the, the smartest thing about that video, I think is when, they're telling him to leave, but they're also telling him to call the cops. So leaving the scene, 
that that's that that's that's a crime in itself. Leaving, yeah. so he doesn't want to leave. I get that. Um, when the old man starts talking talking to him and they start beefing and going back and forth, um, it's one of those things. I don't believe those. Uh, I, maybe those people didn't know who Mike Perry was. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they did, and they're just like, oh, let me instigate. Let me let me just try to push buttons and 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 potentially get a lawsuit. Um, maybe they have no idea who Mike Perry is. They don't even know what mixed martial arts is. Um, but when Perry, when they're yelling back and forth, and I don't remember what the what the man said to Perry, but if it was disrespectful, what did he say? So they were. He was like, you, the the bigger guy, the one that he hit. Yeah. That talk about. He was like, you hit him. And then Mike Perry said, but you guys called the cops. And then the dude like kind of mocked him a little bit saying you called the police or something like that. And then Mike Perry was like, I'll knock your old ass out too. And then went, Buck! And got yeah, him. he said that. And then the guy approached him, right? Didn't yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I can tell from the video. Like, I, I don't remember. I don't know if it was his girlfriend, but a, a, a lady was standing in between that guy kind of hit him. Yeah. Um, so if that guy, when Mike Perry says, I'll knock your old ass out, if that guy puffed up his chest and he wants to shove Mike Perry and get in his face, like, you know, Mike Perry should have more control. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a lot of people walk around talking shit and they don't get hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I guess one of those situations where it's like, I, I really don't know, but I will tell you this. Um, if I'm in a situation where I'm being threatened and I don't know if Perry's being threatened um, and if he felt threatened and he fought, okay, I'm okay with that. I would need more details of that. But um, again, like people are being aggressive towards me, being aggressive back. It's one of those things. Like these kinds of things happen. I'm not, I'm like, I'm not against fighting, right? Um, I think more people should fight. Fighting solves everything. I say it all the time. Um, I don't know that man's situation. I don't know if he's an old guy, if he's just fat and out of shape. I don't know if that guy's an asshole. I don't know what happened before that, any of that. I don't, um, I don't condone bullying people, mm -hmm. but I don't know all the details of that. Um, and if that guy got in Perry's face and they're yelling back and forth with each other, like if Mike Perry wasn't in the UFC, you know, nobody, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Who cares, right? They just that, that 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 if Mike Perry wasn't in UFC, that's on World Star, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Um, but if that fight was was something that 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 was built up on on or the, or the the punching or whatever, if that was built up on on arguments back and forth and two people puffing up their chest and they're going to square up and throw down, then it is what it is. Just because mm -hmm. UFC doesn't mean you can talk shit to him. He should and and. And he shouldn't be allowed to hit you. But at the same time, because of the skill set that he has, right, you shouldn't go around trying to pick fights with people. Yeah, and yeah. I feel like, I mean, everyone knows by now what kind of person Mike Perry is. He's really, he's really out there. He's really emotional. Um, but he probably did need to show a little bit of uh, restraint in that, um, restraint in that situation. Um, and... I also, it kind of looked like to me, obviously I wasn't there. We don't know all the details. It looked like he might have been a little intoxicated. He might have been having some drinks. So that that's another part. Um, I think I saw something that said he got charged with assault. Uh, who knows what will <clears throat> happen with that. But uh, hopefully it was just a, a one-time thing. He doesn't, doesn't uh, keep on doing this. Uh, one thing I did want to touch on, though, was he... Can I say something about that, Dub? Yeah. If he got charged with assault... I hope it was because that was unnecessary. Like I like again, I don't know the details, mm -hmm. but like I don't think just because somebody's in the UFC and you talk shit to them, you shouldn't get hit. You yeah. know? Yeah. Now like if he was being a bully and he got charged with assault, okay. But if 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 that was a fair back and forth and that guy squared up with him, then you 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 maybe you jumped into to a pot you didn't know was cooking. You no, know, well, that that's where I stand mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to wait and see um, about all the details to kind of form an opinion. But that was kind of uh, my to first. Um, the one thing I did want to touch on was 
he came he said the n-word a lot in that video um he kind of got some heat for that i forget how long ago it was um when he said he's two percent african and all that um with all the the racial injustice and the police brutality going on in this country um did that kind of trigger you a little bit at all it triggered me no um or did it i don't I, I like me. I don't condone. I don't care. I don't condone. I don't condone white people saying nigga. Like I don't. I don't. I don't care if if it's if it's the colloquial rap style of using the word or whatever. Like me and Mike, we're not boys. Like we're not tight like that, right? And so like I and and like I don't have any white friends that I'm like, oh yeah, you're, you're cool. It's like, you could say that. Like no, I'm like I'm just I'm just not. Like it's one of those things where it's like. That that's that's him, and that's but like when we if we're having a conversation, bro, don't talk to me like that. We have a problem. Like I know what you're capable of and all that, but but that like don't fucking talk to me like that. That's that's how I roll. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to get into this a little bit. Um. Obviously, I don't want to get too deep into it. But what have your emotions been since um since the unfor- unfortunate murder of George Floyd and all the subsequent um like protests and all just the tension in this country um, since then as a black man. So I'm a black man that didn't grow up in this country, right? I moved here when I was 15. Um, I have lived in America and in a country where most everybody's black. This is the only place that I've had cops pull a gun on me. I've never committed a crime, never committed a felony. I've never done anything for a re- for any reason for someone to point a gun at me. This is the only place where that's happened. Um, George Floyd, the way I feel about that, um, I think I appreciate the, the attention that racial injustice is getting behind that. I think that is primarily because of the situation the world is in. We're in quarantine. There's no, there's no new anything. There's no new... Um, this is new stuff on Netflix, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure. They've been sitting on those things for months. But there's no new football game, no new basketball game, no new baseball. There's no new movies. There's none of that. So there's no shiny new keys to distract people, right? Um, so I think that's why the attention's at, at, at its peak because these, these things, it's, this ain't a new thing. This ain't just happened. To George Floyd. This has been happening since forever. This happened to Emmett Till back in the sixties. This happened in in this happened similar things like this happened in the in the nineties with, with, with like Rodney King. Stuff happened in the eighties. This stuff happened all the time. This <sighs> the Rodney King riots sparked um were sparked off by some some Korean shop owner shooting a young black girl over over orange juice or so, orange soda or something. Right? Um this is this is not a new thing. Right. Um, But because all of the world is on pause, it's getting more attention right now. Um, I hope that when this I hope that something is actually done, you know, some some change is made between now and then, Um, whether it be within the system that's unjust or for black people to understand and recognize that we have to come together and do it for ourselves, you know. Like black people got to deal with black people, white people got to deal with white people. There, like, like there are some black people who say they're no good white people, but I think there are, right? But like they need to deal with the bad white people. They like because cause the bad white people ain't listening to us. That's one, right? And maybe they ain't listening to them. But uh, you guys also control the system. I'm not talking when I say you guys. I know you're a white guy, but I'm talking about you specifically, right? Mm-hmm. Um. You guys control the system, so you guys deal with that. We need to deal with ourselves and build our own system. We need to build our own communities, and we had some of them, and they've been destroyed. So, like, I think right now is the, the perfect time to to get back to that and build our own communities again, and also highlight like this is our community. Like, if this thing falls, we'll make sure to show you who's who's bringing it down and why, right? Mm-hmm. Especially with the internet, because like, take Greenville, Oklahoma, for example, like. That shit was destroyed. They came in and took all those. They killed those people and took all those things. To burn their whole, their whole village, basically, their whole city, and um, and took all their shit, right? Um, they put them in internment, internment camps, and all kinds of crazy shit. But um, build that again, and 
if they come for it, don't allow it. But um, also, or, or make sure that the world sees it. But like the injustice against Africans all over the world, that shit has been going on since the 15th, 1500s. And it continues to this day. And until like we do something about it, like nothing's going to change. Um, it angers me. Uh, the situation, these things keep happening. Um, if you study, you don't even have to study them. You can just get like a, a summary on Malcolm X or the Black Panther Party. And black people in this country are still fighting for and against what Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party were fighting for and against in the 60s. Um, you could tell me things have changed. Yeah, things have changed. Like technology is better. You know, I saw somebody talk about Rodney King. Um, 25 years or how many years since, since 1994, I think. So what's that? 25, 35 years since Rodney King, um, since the Rodney King beating. The only thing that's gotten better is the quality of the video. Like, that's true. You know, that's, that's, that's really it. Nothing, nothing's changed. Um it and 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 these people, <laughs> these people that that make these arguments in defense of those things happening, um, they show you who they really are. And for me, I guess one of the biggest things that I get out of it is like to when people show you who they are, believe them. You know, so like don't make excuses. And I have I have no um, I have no. I don't know what the word is, but no leniency for for that type of attitude, that type of behavior. It's like we can disagree about a whole lot of things and still be friends. The value of human life and racism are two things we can't. Mm-hmm. You know, so so what I take from this is like I I've learned a lot about some people, and I don't have to tell you. I don't have to tell you that like I see you in a different light or I know who you are or any of that. I just have to behave um, with that knowledge now. Mm-hmm. That was that was pretty powerful. Thank you for opening up like that. Um, so you kind of you talked about a little bit about how things are are starting to, starting to change, I guess, in terms of um, how much how much focus has been on it. Um, so in your opinion, for like the white community, what can we do as like, so like for me, as me, or for me as example, as an example, because like obviously I'm not in the government, I don't have any pull um, in terms of that. So like, what can I do or other white people do to help you guys just in everyday life and things like that? See, that's one of those questions where it's like, um, how can I how can I explain it? I if I worded it correctly. Yeah, no, I I, 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 it's okay how you worded it. Um, to help, um, first of all, okay, this is probably the best answer I could give to that question. There, there are racists. There are people who are not racist, and then there are anti-racists. I only told you about two kinds of people just now. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because the racists and the, the non-racists are kind of lumped in together because they accept it, I guess. Yes. The non-racists would accept it. And that, that's, that's, that's my point. Um, mm-hmm. Especially when I say they're not listening to us, so we need like white people... That understand to deal with white people that don't, like alienate them. If if they if if like educate them, and if they don't want to be educated, alienate them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then like there's all these other things. There's all there's so this it's ingrained in in society. There's 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 so many things. You know, there's, there's, first of all, there's so many problems with the world, and like it's funny when you start seeing them. And recognizing them, recognizing them, and just accepting them for what they are. But in this regard, um, you try to explain something to someone, try to educate people on this type of thing. And if they don't want to hear it, 
right? Then you have to leave them alone in that world, right? Their world gets smaller and either they wonder why or not. It creates other problems, yeah, like like mass shootings and shit like that. But like that's something that should have been dealt with. Like I get frustrated because these things are so intertwined um, and (laughs) it's just not dealt with, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like there's going to be a mass shooting in Times Square at some point because you haven't dealt with the problem. You know, like yeah. I, I said years ago, I said in like 2009 to my ex-wife and some friends, this is going to be a mass shooting here on the strip. One night we were out walking on the strip in Vegas on a Friday or Saturday night. It's busy. And I'm like, there's a lot of people out here. Mass shootings happen. One night it's going to happen out here. A couple of years ago it happened. You know, like that's that's just like if you don't deal with the fucking problem, it's going to go. It's it's going to go everywhere. Same thing with um with racism and race relations and the injustice in the system, you know, um, got to deal with it. You know, so if if for the white people that aren't racist, you know, you have to you can't just not be racist. You have to be anti-racist. You have to try to educate people. And if people don't want to be educated. Right. Then. You know, I let isolate that. You don't want to be educated, then you need to be isolated. You know, because yeah. then you 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 have less effect on the group, on the bigger group. Um, that that's that's one thing that I would say. You know, um, and yeah, you're gonna get pushback from a lot of people, but <clears throat> I think in these kinds of situations, to educate someone, you um gotta hold up the mirror, make them see what they don't want to see, like. You know, you hear the argument all the time about, well, what about when you talk about police officers and brutality against blacks? And then you hear, what about black on black crime? Well, what about white on white crime? What about Chinese on Chinese crime and Asian on Asian crime and Latino on Latino crime? First of all, crime is committed against the people you're around mostly. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, um, <clears throat> like, don't, don't, Look at or point this out as if this is a, a, a thing, because that's a thing for everybody, right? And then the other argument that I've heard is like, um, well, cops kill more white people, more um, white people, and blah, blah blah. First of all, there's there's a couple things to that. Um, one, <laughs> the when you when you go back through through the history like of, of of this country and the things that have happened, you know, there are plenty of black people who come up missing and then they don't even write a report about it. You know? So so the stats are skewed, number one. It potentially may like if this I don't know what the stats are, but if the stats are staggeringly high for white people uh, un, unarmed white people being, you know, assaulted or killed by cops, like, yeah, maybe maybe if the stats actually are registered, then maybe like there's 16 white people and 15 black people. Maybe, right? But here's the other thing about that. Don't you think that's a fucking problem? Like, it, it, like, it, like, so like they're killing more black, white people than black, unarmed black people and you don't care? Like, that's just like a defense for like, let them do it? Mm-hmm. Like, how does that even make any sense? You know, like I, I'm, I'm going to stand up for me and mine. You know, like I don't want this to happen to anybody like me just because they look like me. But if you're okay with that happening, then like fuck you and you stay over there. Mm-hmm. Like that's not that's not the reason they bring that argument up. They bring yeah. that argument up because they don't care. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I don't know, man. I I get frustrated, but I I. Through through this, I've gotten to the point where it's like, you know what? Like, I don't have to be frustrated. Like, this this is the world we live in, and like, there are things that can be done to fix it. And I appreciate you asking the question, but like, my answer to that is, like, when I say white people deal with white people, this is one of the things. You know, you can't change the system as an individual, but as an individual, um, you can. I love I loved fighting. Like I love competing, you know? And there are some guys in the UFC, there's some guys 
an LFA, RFA. Um, there's some Japanese kid, right, that decided that he wanted to do mixed martial arts because he saw me fight. You know? So, like, if one, if every non-racist white person became anti-racist, like, imagine the chain reaction that that, that, that has. You're not going to change everybody. You're just not going to change everybody. But can you change enough to hit that tipping point and, and change the world? That's, that's what matters to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate what, you, what you've been saying um, about all this. And I think that an issue that... Should I word this? Um, I think there's an issue of people, white people specifically. They don't... Like, they grew up in an all-white neighborhood, for example, or uh, an area that's predominantly white. And so there's, they experience a lot of racism towards black people, but don't see it like up close. So they're, they don't want to like go against their big group of friends or whatever. They don't think that, um, they can change things just like just by themselves. But I think that change starts with like you and me or not, not specifically you, but me and, um, other people just taking it one person at a time. Try to change one person at a time, and then I mean it's not going to switch overnight. Obviously, nothing really does, but you can start to make a growth in terms of um, just changing the world if you take it one person at a time and just trying to gradually work it up. And I know it's it's easier said than done, and I know that some people don't want to wait that long, and it'll frustrate them. But I think that's my my opinion on how things will change. Like, yeah, I, I don't want to wait that long, right? But it's it's the world we live in. It's the reality of the world. Um, we all have to come to this understanding that everything's not going to ch- change overnight, but there are some things that, there are some things that can and should, um, but they won't, right? But um, <clears throat> if, if we got to play the long game, we got to play the long game. Because... Slavery ended in this country in 1865. Racism ended in this country never. You know, and maybe it ended for an individual. Like there, there are there are less people, or well, not less people, but a less percentage of people, I would assume, in America racist today than yeah. there were in 1866. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. But um we need to continue along that path. Until we get to the point where the system itself doesn't, you know, because I, have you ever heard, have you ever heard the, the, the phrase or a phrase along the lines of if there's one innocent person in jail, like the system has failed or that's a bad thing or have you ever heard that, that concept? Yeah. Okay. You know how many innocent people are in jail and we just accept it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like, like dub. Bro, if we sat, if we really sat down, and had a, 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 a philosophical conversation about the world, like you'd come out of that being a nihilist <laughs> because, like, this shit is fucked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, um, they say these things, but they like these things aren't. Nobody means this. Mm-hmm. If if one person, if if one innocent person being in, imprisoned is, is a bad thing, then why is the Central Park Five a thing? Why does Brian Banks have a story? Why, you know, are all these stories that exist? You know, why, why are these things um, reality? I'm sorry, I got a phone call and that popped up on my screen. Oh, you're um, good. I can still see you. Why, why are these things a reality? Right. So so like let's stop pretending that um the world is what we make it out to be. You know? It's not. And I've learned something. I, I adopted this this philosophy, this motto, um, especially where relationships are concerned. If you want somebody to believe something about you, be that. That's all you have to do. So you have to do. So, like, when the country itself like red lines and does these things, um, 
when when you when you end slavery and then you you like I said do the redlining um, you pay the white slave owners for the loss of property you give them reparations you promise the former slaves 40 acres and a mule and don't deliver you know um, and then 150 years later you want to say that you know why are black people mostly in ghettos why why does a black family make 15 cents for every dollar white family makes it's like you, you can't be serious you you can't you can't be serious when you say <sighs> This is fair or this is right. It's 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 frustrating, mm-hmm. but it's like you you have to just you have to look at the reality, and also you have to look at history. You have to you have to go back and 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 learn about the things that they not, they don't tell you about. Like you see these people on online and in the world, and they talk about um. You see these videos and like cops. Beating up people, doing and well, well, what did they do before that? What happened when cops kill somebody? Well, you don't know what happened, Bruh. Like that's not how that works. Like they're a police officer; they're supposed to uphold the law, and that's it. Protect and serve, and that's it. They're not the judge, jury, or executioner. Like there's there's all these different people involved. Like mm-hmm. ah, that's not how that works. And then they they commit these they commit these acts acts, and then. Nothing happens. Like, I, I, like <laughs> we we could really get into this, but like, that's a whole another couple of hours. Yeah, I mean, I can I can tell that you're pretty frustrated, um, just with everything, and I I understand why you are, and I think you should be. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just a I don't know the the just everything that's happening in this country just sucks right now, in my opinion. Um, there's so much shit that needs change and I think it'll take a while to change it, but I mean, I'm trying to do my part. I'm trying to get other people to do it, but I don't know. I know it'll, I know it'll take a while. Your question that you asked that my answer stays the same, Mm -hmm. but I would also add, um, and I, like, I don't know you personally, so like this might hit home. This might completely miss, but one of the other things I, I thought about this the other day, like a couple of weeks ago, somebody I saw, I was watching a movie and this woman, I think it was Malcolm X. She's like, I'm a good white person and blah, blah, blah. Like what, what, what could I do? Or what do I need to do? Um, you asked a specific question, you know, cause I, and it was off of my question about what do you need to do and how do you deal with other white people and blah, blah, blah. She's asking, what do I need to do? Um, Somebody they asked this in the Malcolm X movie. So there's there's two things about that, right? Um, if somebody asked Malcolm X this in the '60s, why the fuck are they still asking that question today? And if they didn't ask him that, but they asked him that in the '80s when Spike Lee made the movie, why the fuck are they asking that question today? <laughs> right? But like the uh, the answer to that is, you don't have to tell white people how to be good white people to other white people. Right, mm-hmm. like just just be a good person. Just be a good person. Like yep. literally, if if that's if that's the case, if everybody does that, or more people do that, then you don't have a problem. But like, because racism is in in the gumbo now, you got to try to get that shit out of there, right? So, the good white people need to be anti-racist, and they need to affect the racist white people. Mm-hmm. That's my opinion. And I think, I mean, I'm lucky in my, in my life that my parents taught me from a young age that it doesn't, doesn't matter the color of, person's, of a person's skin, um, that they understand that. And my grandparents passed that down um, from them that, like, I don't, I don't really care about anything. If you're cool, you're cool, and I'm going to be nice to you no matter what. Um, but that's just my philosophy. I know that a lot of people grow up with um, parents or grandparents that are super racist and I think that you can kind of tell who those people are, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky in my respect that 
that I came out on the on the other side. And <clears throat> I mean, yeah. Uh, it's it's frustrating when you try when you when you try to put. It's like trying to um. <sighs> It's like when you get a little piece of eggshell in, 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 in your in your bowl when you're trying to crack some eggs. Yeah. Just get trying to get that eggshell out. You can't really put your finger on it. You just it's right there and you, you just can't move it. That's that's what you're dealing with. Yeah. It's just super frustrating. Um so we've been going for like an hour and ten minutes, but I wanted to ask you about one last thing, because I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. Um he's the reason I started my podcast. Um so I wanted to get your uh, your input on the whole people trying to cancel Joe Rogan and Joey Diaz and uh, what you thought of that, knowing Joe as a person. I know Joe as a person, but um, honestly, I don't, I don't know about this. What, 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 why are they trying to cancel Joe Rogan and Joey Diaz? So some guy on Twitter, um, there's a, you get, I mean, you know, you've listened to Joey Diaz, right? Yeah. Podcast or whatever. He says stupid shit. He said that, to get up on the stage at the comedy store, you have to suck his dick. This is the extent to what he's saying. And Joe, it was like on an early, early, early podcast. Joe said, how many times have you done that? And he said, 20. And then Joe started laughing. So then that turned into this whole thing. And uh, this person cut up a bunch of clips of Joe. I mean, I know you don't agree with that. But to me, like, if you go back and watch those episodes, he was saying, he wasn't saying it like, I don't know. It's hard to explain. You'd have to go back and watch the episodes. He was saying it like that person called that person of the N word, but he, I, I think he should have said the N word instead of actual, the actual word, but people are just trying to cancel him about that. And I mean, you know, Joe, he gets high and says a bunch of stupid stuff. So people were trying to cancel him for that. Um, it's a weird thing where, um, if, if I'm quoting somebody else, like Joey Diaz saying, yeah, he called that guy, uh, you know, an N-word. Or he called that guy a nigga. It's like, okay, he's saying what somebody else did. I get it. Like, I, it's. It was less of that, and it was more of the, like, Joe kind of endorsing sexual abuse, I guess. Which he doesn't, but, I mean, that's what people were trying to cling on to. <sighs> it's kind of hard to explain explain it to the you context, yeah the context is, is is missing but um i and i i only reason i give dudes benefit of the doubt is because they're comedians and they do some of this shit for entertainment i know some of this shit could be offensive right um but like there's there's two schools of thought um if that's their comedy and you are you're signing up for that right um so, so my thing is, once you, once you go into a comedy club, right? Um, comedy club is like no holes barred for words. That's yeah. that's how I feel about that, right? Um, like you could pretend to be somebody else on stage as a com- at a comedy club. Podcasts have taken comedy clubs to to the internet and things like that. So, like without the context, I I can't I can't be sure. Um, I. I yeah I really don't know. Um, I don't I don't think you cancel somebody over, over. Yeah, it's weird, man. Because it's kind of like it it, it it sounds like it could potentially be like why Kevin Hart didn't host the host the, the the Emmys or whatever or the Oscars, you know? Because he made some joke about lesbians like ten years ago or something like that. It's it, like, it kind of like that. It's like it's weird, like mm-hmm. things. The past is the past, and I don't know, man. Um, but also, like, if you don't just fucking bail, like, if you you don't like it, then if I don't like something somebody has to say, I'm not gonna follow them. Like, you you could try to take away their livelihood and do all of this and whatnot, but guess what? The people that appreciate that, they're still going to do it. You're wasting your fucking time, you know. Mm-hmm. Just you stop contributing to that, you know, and you move on with you. And and if everybody, because like, guess what, like you know who you you know you turn you turn a bunch of new people on to that motherfucker that probably like that, mm-hmm. you know, by bringing out you. Hey, look at this shit. This guy is shitting in a cup and then eating it. You know, like 
You know how many people watch Two Girls One Cup who never saw that before? <laughs> Millions. <laughs> because you talk about it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Just bail on it and leave leave it to die. Yeah. That that's how I feel about things like that. Um so like yeah, I um and I, and, I, and that's getting stronger with me. It's like you see th- I I've I've I used to comment on things often, but like sometimes and then I started getting to the point where I'm like that's fucking stupid. Nah, just delete that shit. Fuck it. I'm just moving on. That's what. That's the same thing I do on Facebook. Yeah. So I, I can't. Facebook that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so last thing I wanted to ask you is when you do go on JRE, what's kind of like the feel of that going on the biggest podcast in the world compared to doing a dinky little podcast from a college kid like me? <laughs> Man, everybody, everybody starts somewhere, you know? We all start the same place. Um, but, like, you know, Joe, is, it's fun to be on his podcast, you know. Um, you know a lot of people are going to gonna hear what you have to say. Um, so you want to you wanna be sharp. You want to know what you th- – you just you want to speak on what you know, you know. Um, yeah. But you always want to speak on what you know. I don't want – I don't like, I'm not going to try to pretend because then – Somewhere somebody's gonna be like, I know what I know the subject he's talking about, and that guy's a fucking idiot. And I, I don't yeah. like like it's like I said to you before, you want someone to believe something about you, then be that thing. I don't want people to think that I'm an idiot, so I'm gonna try not to be an idiot and I'm not gonna speak on things that I don't know about or don't have a passion for or, or care for. Um but Joe's podcast is fun, you know, he he's he, he's easy to talk to. You know, he's a great conversationalist. So to sit down with Joe and to have a back and forth, um, to have a rapport with the guy, like that helps too. But like, uh, even if you don't like Joe's podcast or an episode of his podcast, you reckon you should be able to recognize that he's a great conversationalist. He knows how to keep a conversation moving, not let it get stuck. And um, that's a whole lot of fun. His His studio... It's a, it's a cool place. He has some cool stuff in there, um, and you know, it's it's someone someone in the fight game, someone who I've I've had admiration for over time, you know. And so because of that, um, to be welcomed into that space, it's cool, cool as fuck, you know. Um, at the same time, you know, he when when you're in that environment, at the very least, you recognize that hey, he's just a regular guy, um, and it's it's fun to see sometimes someone who people look up to in that capacity and to recognize that yeah like as a human being we're on the same level yeah um and then really quick give me your three predictions for the three title fights um jan and aldo holloway and volkanovsky too and then masvidal and usman before i let you go i think that weight cut is like it's going to be easier for, or not easier, but better for Jose now. His body's experienced it before, um, but I think Jan is going to be too much. I don't know if Holloway's made the adjustments. Uh, I think he has to make some adjustments. Um, he came off of fighting Dustin, then he fought um, Volkanovski. He got two losses back to back, and I think if he was facing somebody else, it may be different. But um, mm. I love Max. I want to see him win this fight. But that's all about him making adjustments. And I didn't see him making any in that fight. Um, so I feel that Volkanovski has the opportunity to look at what adjustments that he could have made and have some contingencies for for those. And, um, and then Holloway is going to be a step behind. Um, so I think Volkanovski wins that one in a similar fashion, but I think he may get the stoppage late in that one. Um, and then barring the weight cut hurt in Masvidal, man, I think he takes that one. I think he finishes that fight probably in the fourth. I'm hoping so, man. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. This was probably my favorite podcast I've done. It was a really good conversation. and I'm, I'm honored that you, uh, you were willing to come on and talk to me. Nah, Dub, I appreciate it, man. And when you make it big time, don't forget us little guys. No, I'm still going to have you on whenever. (laughs) (laughs) You brother. Appreciate it. Peace out, everybody. Stay in touch.